Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I've seen people on from all over the state, Texas, Kansas, Virginia, Jersey. Hey, Barb O'Neill. Hey, Elizabeth Gish. Hey to all of my Arkansas folks who joined today. We are so delighted with us to have this panel from University of Minnesota. Our topic today is overindulgence. How much is too much? This is the regularly scheduled Zoom webinar for the Financial Security for All Community of Practice, but it is open to all Extension educators, so I'm glad to have everyone here today. So we have with us today on the panel, Jean Ilsley Clark. Jean is the author of How Much is Too Much and the lead author of this University of Minnesota Extension program. We also have Becky Hagen Jokula, and she is a professor in family resource management, and she is also an accredited financial counselor. Kelly Kunkel is a community health educator. She's a certified health education specialist. Ellie McMahon, hi Ellie, is a family resilience extension educator, and uh, Ellie also has Arkansas ties. So, so welcome to our homegirl, Ellie. Uh, Lisa Kraus is a parenting coach and adjunct professor, so you can see that all subject matter areas are really well represented. You can read their full bios on the LEARN event on the learn.extension.org website, and that's also where the recording of this session will be housed along with the PowerPoint and handouts and educational materials that they're providing today. So. Please join me in welcoming this overindulgence team from University of Minnesota. And up first is Becky. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. We are so glad to have everyone joining us today. And we are here to explore the concept of overindulgence. That is, how much is too much? Overindulgence is an issue many people face in our society as the research and literature has shown us. And you will be hearing more about the research involved in our work. I'd like to share just the depth and breadth of our team of 10. And as Laura mentioned, we have authors and Jean Ilse Clark being the lead author in How Much Is Too Much research as such, but also includes the partnering of U of M Extension Educators and representation by Concordia University and technical support. So it's quite vast and we're excited to tell our story. Our multidisciplinary team has worked together for seven years and has represented a partnership of three content areas of overindulgence. And that includes the financial, nutrition, and parenting. The team benefits, we believe, working together and partnering in that holistic view of overindulgence really helps answer a lot of questions and it's of keen interest. Fact sheets have been developed for each of the content areas that we will identify later and they are shared with you. We initially came together to develop the course Parenting in the Age of Overindulgence. And this is an online course. And we do have other courses as well that will be explained later. Our audience consists of parents, child care providers, teachers, caregivers, grandparents, and professionals, all looking to increase self-awareness and self-efficacy needed to reduce overindulgence provide education, information, strategies, and tools. Our objectives for today's webinar include the following, to learn about what is overindulgence, to know the three ways to overindulge, the test of four, ways to reduce overindulgence, and to highlight our on-course offerings. At this time, we'd like to begin our session today with a poll, and the question is, in your experience, does overindulgence come up seldom, sometimes, or frequently? And thank you, Mark, for launching our poll. So if everyone would take a moment to vote, we will see our results. And we'll just take... Uh... 
We've already had about half the folks vote. We'll take another 10 seconds. All right, I'm ending that poll and I'll share the results now. Okay, very interesting. So you can see there certainly are varied thoughts and opinions on the frequency of overindulgence. Thank you, Mark. Okay, at this time, I'll pass the uh, presentation over to Jean. Go ahead. The, uh, I'm going to talk about the research. Uh, and uh, we three, uh, the, Dr. Bretta Huff and uh, Dr. Dawson, decided that we needed to know more about research. That was in 1996. So we looked for the research on it and found nothing, zero, zip. So we did the original groundbreaking study. Since then, uh, we have done nine more studies, all of those done with independent uh, validated instruments. Uh, <clears throat> we have um, surveyed more than 3,500 people. Uh, we have written uh, two books, How Much is Enough, gave us the starting material, and then How Much is Too Much, we have added one of the, many of the end pieces of research, and uh, that includes uh, self-image, it includes, uh, the, the book now covers grandparents, and uh, also includes how to recover as an adult from overindulgence if you experienced it. Uh, the research really has three parts. One is what is overindulgence, one is who does it, and one is what are the outcomes. So we will be exploring those uh, as we go through. So I'm going to read, excuse that, but I want it to be absolutely accurate, the definition that we got out of the research. Overindulging children is giving them too much of what looks good too soon or too long. It's giving them things or experiences that are not appropriate for their age or their interests and talents. It is the process of giving things to children to meet the adult's needs, not the children's. This was a big surprise to me. Overindulgence is giving disproportionate amounts of family resources to one or more children in a way that appears to be meeting the children's needs, but does not. So children experience scarcity in the midst of plenty. Overindulgence is doing or having so much of something that it does act of harm, or at least it prevents the person from, the de from developing and deprives the person of achieving his or her full potential. Overindulgence is a form of child neglect. It hinders children from performing their needed developmental tasks and from learning necessary life lessons. So, Grim. So, if this is true, what are the outcomes? What happens? What happens to adults who were overindulged as children? And all of the information that we give you on this, uh, we've done the research on a continuum, like almost never overindulged to really, really frequently. We're only giving you results from that very top group. So Ellie, uh, how about you telling us what adults who've been overindulged to say. And these are direct quotes. I feel sad and angry when I don't get my way or I don't get what I want. I often feel disappointed in others and let down by them. The more I give, the more I expect. 
I am so far in debt, I can't see the light of day. I am overweight, I'm discontent, overdue, and I feel empty still. Yeah. So the hazards of overindulging children, this is kind of impact that it may have. There are seven. Will you give us those? Yes. Trouble learning how to delay gratification as an adult. Trouble giving up status as the constant center of attention. Trouble becoming competent in everyday skills, self-care, and the ability to relate with others. Trouble taking personal responsibility. Trouble developing a sense of personal identity. Trouble knowing what is enough. And trouble knowing what is normal for other people. Yeah. And all of this, as nearly as we can tell, comes from a good heart. It it's, does. It's not parents saying, well, honey, today in order to hazard the kids when they're grown up, let's really overdose. No, no, no. It's done perhaps almost always with the wish of helping kids be happy, seeing that they have fun, making their lives easy, protecting them from stress. So uh, the three ways that overindulgence is done is with too much over nurture and soft structure and too much is too much of anything that costs money it's food clothing entertainment uh, sports equipment uh, lessons um, camps anything it's the one that we see when I ask people what they think overindulgence is, they, t they usually respond with a story about some kid they know who has too much. Overnurturing is important one because it bothered the adults more than too much. Overnurturing is doing for children what they should be doing for themselves and thus keeping them from learning life's lessons. And it, it sounds like this, oh honey, that part is hard, I'll do that for you. Or uh, let me do that, you're looking tired. Or I don't have right now to teach you, time to teach you how to do that. So I'll just do it for you. And then it becomes a habit. And uh, what the children learn from that is to be helpless and this is, a pity because children are born to be competent. That's hardwired into us when we get here. And so they have to unlearn what their nature is and learn to be helpless. Soft structure means that the structure in the family is not strong enough. And it looks like um, no rules, no chores, no rules or the rules aren't followed through on uh, and caving on a rule now and then teaches children to be flexible caving on a rule all the time means instead of teaching children to be competent we're teaching them how to manipulate us how to whine soft structure includes chores because this is where Children learn to be competent. So we have those five skills involved in doing a chore. What is it? What is this household task that I'm to do? Do I know how to do it or do I find out? Do it. Finish it. And number five, put the gear away. And this, I submit, is what we all do every day when we go to work. Only if we learn to do this when we were three, it's automatic. We don't have to think our way through it. And the overindulged adults told us, I don't know how to do things. I spend so much time and energy 
figuring out how to do something that everybody else seems to know how to do. So those are the three ways that it's done. And uh, soft structure uh, leads to irresponsibility because with parents who are willing to, to cave on the rules and cave on the directions, um, what the children learn is, I don't have to do it. It really is somebody else's responsibility. Very unfortunate when they get into the workplace. So, staying the center of the universe, being helpless, being irresponsible, not things that we plan on. And so why would parents do this? I think, myself, that there are probably as many reasons as there are parents. One day it's because I'm tired, and another day it's because I just don't have the zoomph to do it, and another day I'm in a hurry, and uh, I do it because I didn't have this, and I wanted my children to have it. I do it because I can, I have enough money, there's enough affluence, or I do it because there isn't enough money, and so I make up by giving too much freedom, something like that. And um, so, in since grandparents also overindulge, or another whole group of them are resentful that they can't because the parents have already done it, uh, we have to look, we have to consider that overindulgence has become a new normal. In our research, we turned up 32 ways that parent, reasons that parents overindulge. Uh, I submit there may be hundreds. So, Miss Becky, let's hear an example of, let's hear a scenario about an incidence of overindulgence. Yes, um, thank you, Jean. Just to note before we go forward, if anyone does have questions, we encourage you to uh, type in your questions in the Q&A, and we will pause periodically for questions momentarily, and then at the end, um, answer. So please, we encourage you to type in your questions. Yes, thank you, Jean. And looking at, again, reflecting on the program areas, just to highlight that my area is financial, and we often think of the too much. And looking at a fact sheet that would be shared with you, we have a link on the course as well. But thought it was important to encourage families to take time to think about money decisions, that there is prime opportunity to encourage children to learn about money management, wants and needs and all those uh, factors as a part of financial education and to provide opportunities for practice in regard to budgeting and making spending decisions and observation of adults as role models. So this fact sheet is on finances and it's with a picky spender, our theme, as you'll notice. And going forward, the scenario that I'd like to share with you and get your opinion about would be this. Anne and Mike have a 13-year-old daughter, Megan. One Saturday morning, the family went to the mall for a pair of jeans. Megan had a very specific pair of jeans in mind, ones like her best friend. When her parents saw the jeans, they were shocked at the price. They were much more expensive than originally agreed upon by Megan and her parents. Megan insisted that she had to have this particular pair of jeans, irregardless of the price. Nothing else would do, and Anne and Mike reluctantly purchased the jeans for Megan. And then this will be a poll. Um, we'll see what you think. Is this overindulgence? And if you'll take a moment to answer, and then we'll see the results. And then get Jean's opinion. Okay, we'll take uh, about 10, another 10 seconds. Okay. 
right, I'm sharing the results now. Okay, interesting. Yeah, again, a few varied views. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Ella, let us talk through the test of four on this particular scenario. Um, and I'm, I, I like seeing your results that some of you think it's overindulgence and some of you do not because overindulgence is complex. And you can look at a question one way or another. And, um, and because what might be overindulgence for one child may not be for another. So this is the test of four. It's a test that Connie and I developed to help us think about how to make decisions about whether things are overindulgent or not. Uh, and there are four points to it. And the first one is, does it get in the way of children learning a developmental task? So, what about this child? What about Megan? Do you think that getting her the genes would delay her development in any way? Um, I would guess no. What do you think, Jean? Uh, well, it depends. Uh, if this is done only now and then, then I would say no. If this is a regular habit, then I would say she's not learning to manage money. She's not learning to manage a wardrobe. She may not be learning to be a working member of the family because she's lobbying for what she wants. And it sounds to me like weak structure because her parents had already given her an amount that she could have. So I would say probably. Uh, what about family resources? Would giving her the genes um, in some way use too much of family resources? And family resources are not only money, their time and energy, uh, psychic income, if the parents are really going to be upset about things, that's a piece of family resources. Mm -hmm. So would you say that, the, that buying the genes uh, would impact family resources? I'm going to guess and say yes. And it's lovely that at least uh, Becky said we're go she's going to guess because we can't really know about whether something is overindulgence unless we are inside the family. All we know financially is that she had been told an amount to spend and they thought they shouldn't spend more and they did. So that sounds like a yes. Okay. The question in overindulgence is whose needs are being met? More for the child or more for the adult? Child. And how do you see that, Lily? Well, I was thinking that perhaps the peer wanting to be like her friends might have swayed the decision or the intent. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it may be very helpful to her to, uh, to dress like her friends. Uh, on the other hand, if the parents caved because they want to make her happy and they really shouldn't have for financial reasons, or maybe they had decided that she's getting just too much of what she wants and it's, hold, it's time to hold the line, but they caved in order to avoid uh, uh, uproar. Uh, then, then the answer would be uh, the parents' needs are very important here. Mm -hmm. So that's a possible yes. Mm -hmm. What about possible harm? Is giving her the genes apt to cause harm to others, 
to the environment? I'm going to say no on that one. What do you think? Probably not. We could make a great big case, I suppose, but it just looks like that. So what did we have? For developmental tasks, we, I would say we had a probably. For family resources, we had a maybe. Uh, for whose needs, I would go with probably. Because in order to hold the line and stay with their position, and you know they could have said, there is this money for your genes, and if you earn the rest, you can get them. So I would, I would tend to say yes there, that it is for the needs of the parents. Possible harm, no. So the outcome is, this is a, a scenario that we would need to really think about. And this is always true. We need to think about it and to consider that we don't have all of the data. So, overindulgence is done in three ways. Uh, would you say that this is too much, giving her the genes? That's where I first um, noted I probably would choose that. Yep. And could it be an example of over-nurture? Yes, I believe. If this happened often, upon the child's uh, desires for new expensive genes, could it be? Sure, could be. And how about soft structure? Yes, I like that term you use, caving in. Yeah. So. It looks like there could be parts of all three ways of overindulging in this scenario. Now, remember, as we look at these people, that our findings are that overindulgence almost always or always comes from a good heart. So we are going to look for ways to help people avoid it rather than judging them because they're doing it in any way. Since we live in this age of overindulgence, we are probably all doing it sometime or other. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go on to Kelly next. Thank you. And um, this is a fact sheet on um, connecting overindulgence to health and nutrition. And it's a fact sheet that starts off with the picky eater, I want a peanut butter sandwich. And we may know children, have had children in our lives that want to have one food over and over and over again. And sometimes as parents or caregivers, we give into that. And this fact sheet talks a little bit about Ellen Satter's work of division and responsibility. And it's the adult and um, caregiver that provides the food but it's the child, child that decides if they eat or how much they eat, which can be a, a real challenge um, for us. Um, it also breaks things down by age group. So um, preschool, elementary, and teenage group, you know, there are developmentally things that um, children can do um, with um, the, their meal time and planning consistent snacks or um, being good role models and watching good role models and parent child involvements in the planning and in the preparation. And similar to the, the spender, we're going to talk a little bit about a family today and Jean's going to help us um, work through this and if this is overindulgence. Um, the family is Daria, she is a single parent and she has two boys, two children, Dimitri is eight and Ivan is five. And Daria works full time as a housekeeper at a large chain hotel, but to make ends meet she also needs to work at the local convenience store. Money is tight. And she's also very tired as a single parent. Sometimes when she gets home at night, sometimes being two to three times a week, she lets Dimitri and Ivan decide what they want to eat from the cupboard. Um, Ivan in particular at five loves to make himself a bowl of cereal. He likes the characters on the box. And Dimitri will just grab whatever kind of leftovers there might be out of the refrigerator and heat it up. Daria really doesn't make any comments about what they choose or have any say about their food choices. <coughs> but the question is, is this overindulgence? 
And right now, we're, Mark is going to pull up a poll. Here it is. And just take a moment to answer and with this example, is this overindulgence? Okay, we'll take uh, about 15 seconds. Okay, just uh, about another five seconds. Okay, ending the poll and sharing the results. Looks like our results are a bit more mixed this yeah. time. Yeah. Yes, it is, really. And sometimes it's just not clear, is it? Jean, can you work us through this with a test of four? Well, let's try it. Uh, what about developmental tasks? Uh, is, is just turning the meals over to the child, to two children, is that going to delay either one of them developmentally, do you think? Well, certainly um, they're learning a, a little bit about cooking and, uh, and you know, being more self-sufficient. Are they developmentally able to make the decisions about what the best foods are when they're um, on their own or running their own, just making their own decisions? Yeah. See, on the one hand and on the other hand. Uh, on the one hand, they're learning to be resourceful, uh, to be helpful, to be a contributing part of the family by taking over these tasks. And uh, on the other hand, if those are sugar cereals, and, and a five-year-old is having them three nights a week. This is certainly a nutritional problem. And uh, the developmental tasks there would be what he's not learning. He's not learning uh, to be part of the family at dinner and with all of the goodies that that gives families. Uh, he's not learning about nutrition and about uh, trying new foods. Uh, and so I would uh, tend to come down that this is a yes, that the, he can learn to be resourceful in other ways. Uh, and you may view that differently because all of us are making all of these decisions based based actually on our family values. So what about family resources? Uh, does allowing the children this freedom to choose somehow use too much of family resources? Well, again, it's one of those things where it potentially can harm family resources. If uh, money is tight, as it is in this family, and they're planning their meals for the week, um, the children might be grazing and eating that food that will be planned for a meal later on. And so um, just knowing where the different resources, food resources are available in the community are so important. So it's potentially um, harming the family resources. Yes, and uh, this particular scenario, I really like that you presented it because it's so hard. Actually, on family resources, what we're dealing with uh, is a mother who doesn't have enough resources. And so, while well, we would need to look outside of the family to help her uh, get, get some more food, maybe not have to work so much so she's not so tired, so the family resources is just a really big problem in this one. It's very hard for me to answer. So I will say, maybe, probably, I don't know. And sometimes we don't know. And so by letting the children make these decisions, whose needs are being met? In this situation, I think the mom's needs, Daria's needs, are probably being met the most. Um, she's just tired, and she's taking the path of least resistance. Yeah. And so I would have to say yes here, too. But also, since we already know how, how the family resources look, 
you know, my heart goes out to her because maybe she just can't do it. Nevertheless, it's her needs. And so we have to say yes here. How about possible harm? Will this harm other people or the planet? No. Probably not. So if we look at this test of four, without male tasks, probably. Family resources, oh my. Whose needs? Yes, the mother's needs. Possible harm, no. Conclusion, have to really look at it and think about it. Uh, but I would come down on the side of yes. So, um, Kelly, what can be done instead? Well, this area falls really under the air, um, under soft structure when we look at the three different areas. And so certainly giving um, Daria the tips and tools that she needs, um, particularly food resources. So connecting her with SNAP, connecting her with available food resources in the community. Another option might be to, um, to provide choices for her children that are healthy and good. And so um, rather than just letting them choose on their own, um, she can do what we used to do in my family. We called it buffet night. And I would pull out the different types of foods that I would offer to my children. And then they would make the selection based on the foods I offered. And so there was still that choice, but I knew that they were getting the nutritious food um, as, as the choices that they, that they could make. I like that idea a lot. I'm going to adapt that or adopt it. Definitely. Thank you, Jean. And Kelly, as I move into my scenario on overindulgence in parenting, I'd like you to look at the chat box um, because we have a couple questions about dietary harm. Um, I am going to um, talk th with Jean through a scenario on overindulgence in parenting. And this is around a parenting sit situation um, of getting your children um, dressed when they are a younger age. Um, also, as elementary school children, um, it can be tricky. Um, and we want to set our children up for success let them know how much time they have in the morning to get ready, and then they move into the teenage years. So um, this fact sheet is also located within our um, parenting um, within overindulgence course. But this, my situation is about a preschooler, Jean, and I know this family who has a four-year-old daughter who really wants to wear her puppy shirt every single day. She has a tantrum if she's not allowed to wear it, regardless of whether the shirt is clean or not, or, or available. The parents let her wear it every day that it's not in the dirty clothes. Um, so now we're going to ask our audience, is this an example of overindulgence? Okay, lost in that poll now will take about 20 seconds. And this is great for me at a personal level. I have a, uh, a daughter. She'll be turning three. And, <laughs> and so uh, all of this is, is fun, to, fun to see if I'm if That's we're great, over, Mark. Over, over, over indulging or not. <laughs> so we'll just take another 10 seconds. Am I doing that or she doesn't need that? Did she need that? All right, so I think this was a, another one that was probably tough for, for folks. We'll share the results. Oh, look at that split. <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost right down the middle. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I'm wondering if we have several parents of preschool children <laughs> who have their favorite clothes to wear. Um, all my children are adults, but I have been there as well. So um, 
We are not going to walk through the test of four with this one. I'm going to keep you thinking about this because Jean and I walk through the test of four in our class with this situation. So you are welcome to go in and view our conversation about this little girl in her puppy shirt. Um, and the link for our class is in the chat box. All right, so we have um, another question to ask. Um, so if Mark could put this poll up, and it's the same question as earlier, but now that you are a bit more familiar with overindulgence, in your experience, does overindulgence come up seldom, sometimes, or frequently? And we'll just take another 10, 10 seconds. Okay, and we'll end that, and I'll share the results there. So those have also changed, which means we're all learning together about overindulgence, and that, as Jean said earlier, it really comes from a good heart, and the key is trying to figure out when those situations arise. All right, so some of the resources that um, our team provides, as Jean mentioned earlier, she is the author of How Much is Too Much, which is, um, I don't know if I should use the word Bible, but I would equate it to a parenting um, really, really used book. Yeah. Um, it's very, very practical. And I had a conversation with another colleague about how much she uses this book and how she uses it. She has three children under the age of four. Um, also, um, our next resource, if we can switch the slide, is um, as you have the link, we have all kinds of information on our Parenting in the Age of Overindulgence um, website page. We also have um, several online courses. Parenting in the Age of Overindulgence is our current course, and we have used many examples from that course today. Parenting with a Good Heart, Learning to Live Lives with of Abundance Without Overindulgence, should be published very, very soon. We are quite excited about that. And Parenting Developmental Highway, we are in the trenches working on that course as we speak, so that is also coming soon. A few more um, resources, Parenting in the Age of Overindulgence um, presents evidence-based research in a very kind of new way. The course was developed by our multidisciplinary multi team to provide a very practical um, approach with parenting tools um, that is very relatable. Um, it's used by both professionals as tools or resources and directly for parents. We also, um, as Laura mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, have a partnership with Arkansas, and we have developed some take and teach lessons for this online course. So in a bit of a summary, to recap our time together today, we talked about what is overindulgence, the three ways um, that overindulgence can happen. Um, what do we do? We can use the test of four as parents. We also talked about ways to reduce overindulgence and a variety of our online course offerings. So now we would like to um, take questions and definitely say thank you for this opportunity to be with you today. So if you can put your questions in the chat box, we would welcome those. Okay, so no no questions at this time, but yeah, folks, uh, feel free to put questions in either Q&A or, or chat and uh, we can address them there. Looks like Sasha is a new mom and is um, grateful to learn these things now. But no matter where you are in parenting, um, I'm going to quote Jean, it's never too late. 
So great question, Chad. Someone says, uh, an, an, an anonymous attendee says, are there any resources available for children that have grown up being overindulged and have problems due to this? Yes. Uh, all the way through the how, how much is too much book are tips for people who have been overindulged and want to recover. Okay. Amy in chat says, uh, what, uh, what ways are we going to be using this material with our clients? And then uh, examples, she says, workshops, Facebook posts, online course. Mark, I think that's, uh, Amy in, in Arkansas, I think that's a question for us as we are adapting these mm -hmm. materials for use in our states. And I know that we're take, we'll have lesson plans for several different topics within this, but there is the online course that's already developed and the link for that is in the chat. Ellie and I both posted that. And then of course, you can always pull out uh, tweets and posts and use those to promote your educational, your entire educational program and the overindulgence program and course. So answer your question, Amy. And then we had another question back in the Q&A for our overindulgence team. It says, is the focus to get parents and grandparents to self-identify so they can make corrections? Well, I think uh, that any, that I hope that comes from within that I want to do it, but I also think that the rest of us can nudge, nudge gently. And I would recommend, if you're going to recommend the book, that you don't say, read this, it would be good for you. But instead you say, uh, I met the author on a webinar and I wonder if you think this is helpful. And then we have another question, which is, how many sections need to answer yes to be qualified as overindulgence? Well, you know, parenting is an art. And I want to say one, but you have to look at the situation and make the best decision that you can. Jean, we also have Donna who has asked us to define harm. Harm? Harm, yes. Ooh, isn't that good? Is this harm? Is this harmful? Uh, I, I would say, we're not speaking about harm here in, in uh, did you hurt your arm? But we're talking about growth. And so anything that keeps the child from growing to the fullest potential that that child can, I would, I would identify as harm and I would put it in a continuum. Might be harmful, a little bit harmful, a lot, a whole, a whole lot. But letting children grow within a safe structure, within a family that has rules and boundaries so the kid knows what to push up against and also knows that the family's got his back is, is very important. And uh, one of the things that we can do in avoiding overindulgence, I mean, the things, some of the things, is to get enough but not too much is to let children do the things over nurture, to let children do the things they should be doing and uh, not um, trying to always protect them and keep them from distress. I think one of the things I would like to do with parents right now at this age is teach them that kids, some kids need to struggle at times. And the art is to let them struggle enough to learn, not enough to feel defeated. And then the other thing is to provide the safe environment so children can work. Jean, what about, I know that a lot of people struggle, myself included, when we talk about harm in the context of the test of four, would this cause possible harm? What are we looking at there? You just kind of just... Oh, on the outside? Okay, I'll give you an example, a grown-up example. Uh, a businessman traveling, 
just throws the suits in the suitcase and bangs it shut. Gets to the hotel and they're all wrinkled. Hangs them up, turns the shower on full blast, and goes out to dinner. Well, this is overindulging himself with not building in a good structure for taking care of his clothes. And how it harms the environment is water is one of our precious resources. Um, sometimes we look at harming the environment as um, throwing things away. And that often comes from too much. I'm thinking of the child who broke something and the hostess said, that was really important to me. I feel bad about that. And the child said, buy yourself another. So um, it, it isn't always harmful to the environment, but it is a question that we need to ask. Um, I just wanted to let everyone on the web or on the webinar know that um, all of our online courses are free. Um, because someone had asked about that. And Jean, we have someone who is asking about, what about overindulgence with kids with learning disabilities or special needs? Oh, that's a hard one. Because our hearts go out to them, and it is so easy to overprotect. And uh, I, I was uh, brought to a child who will never walk. And her mother said, she's just a pill to live with. She wants what she wants, and she wants everything her way. And, um, and I thought, what do I do with this? You know. And so I said, how about if you teach her the difference between wants and needs? And then just intuitively, I picked a number. Then afterward, I prayed that it was right. And I said, how about giving her everything that she needs that you can and half of what she wants? And then I left and I thought, how did you dare to do that? Well, the woman was so distressed that I felt that I wanted to give her something. And uh, she sent word six weeks later that she had been using that and that the daughter had calmed down. So sometimes... When we give advice out of a good heart, it helps. Thanks, Jean. And we also have two questions about low-income families. Have you found from your work with families directly using these materials, do families with very limited resources easily identify with the test of four? Also, someone has said, this is amazing. I knew there was a problem, but I didn't know how to define it and what to do. Comment, overindulgence causes crosses socioeconomic groups. I work in a high poverty county. What has been your success in working with low income parents and caregivers? Okay, the first one, uh, do, do poverty people connect with the test of four? So far, in the people I've worked with, it does, but I have a very small N, so don't count on that. Uh, and then about um, overindulgence crosses socioeconomic groups. Yes, definitely. Uh, and uh, success in working with them. Uh, I'm not working directly with them now, but um, you agents are. So how, what's your answer to that? Um, I found that in regard to resources, it can be interpreted very differently. Um, money, of course, being one. But I talked with one mother who just found stuffed animals, many, many, at the garage sales and whatnot. And the question was, truly, how many are enough? Because the number kept growing and growing and growing. So even though they could acquire it, at a lower no cost, it still was that question, you know, how many do you need, question mark. And um, I found that, that sometimes it falls under the soft structure because if you can't financially afford to give over uh, overindulge too much. You can't overcompensate by providing them overindulgence in other ways, maybe like being more lax on um, foods and the example we gave earlier, or maybe a curfew that's not 
Um, I deserve this much. Kelly, too much freedom came up in the research. I, I don't, I can't buy the toys, but so let him go. Mm -hmm. Let him have, let him do what he wants to. Yeah, skip the chores. Jean, we also have a comment from someone who says, as a foster mother, there is a fine line to nurturing and helping versus overindulgence. We don't want our daughters to use their circumstances as a crutch for life. Oh, how good to mm -hmm. recognize that. Those fine lines are what challenge us. And I think it's helpful to, it's helpful to me to remember in overindulgence that there is a structure we can learn about it, like the test of four and knowing what it is. But also, parenting is an art. And we take into account the child and the child's temperament. We take into account our family values. And we wrench ourselves from the provisional image we had of what our child would be and learn to love the child that is emerging. I knew, I knew how all three of my kids should turn out and exactly what they should be, and none of them did that. And you know what? They're wonderful. Big surprise. <laughs> Your questions are very, very helpful. Okay, we still got a few minutes left, so any final questions, folks, please put them in. I'm just, you know, thinking about this idea of overindulgence, uh, maybe for parents more, but I guess kids too. As a software developer and engineer and thinking about technology, I just think about the last 20 years, what's happened with, you know, eBay and Amazon and just the ability to point and click and, and have stuff, right? Have stuff show up at your door. So I, uh, I, I don't know if, if anyone has any thoughts on that and if there's any research out there, but I think that certainly the emergence of the internet and the internet economy uh, is either a result or has had an effect on, um, you know, this idea of overindulgence. Mm -hmm. We have talked about technology and the, its use, and um, Jean has talked us through some examples with her grandchildren and mm -hmm. if certain purchases should be made or used. Or, mm -hmm. And the test of four is so very helpful. That's, yeah. Because it, it really gets us to think about development and all of those questions that we need to be asking as parents. Mm -hmm. We have found it helpful with adult children uh, when something happens in their lives that makes it different from what we expect to be normal at that age. Uh, like at one point, our daughter started to lose her hearing. And so we then had to re-enter the parenting picture and say, honey, even if you don't want to do this piece that the doctor recommends, come on, you have to do it. And uh, and she was appreciative, but she needed that backup of we're, we're here, we're on your team, do this. Uh, I remember she wasn't supposed to lift anything. And so she said, well, I can take care of that. I'll just put the storm windows on one at a time. Mm. And we said, no, 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 no. Somebody else puts on the storm windows. <laughs> so we keep learning because we are parents all of our lives mm -hmm. and of course the good thing is the kids parent us too especially with the technology <laughs> i wanted to remind everyone that we'll have the recording of this session posted on the the page with the learn event learn extension dot learn dot extension dot org and then where the announcement for this event was located that's where the clip the link to the uh, recording of this webinar will be posted. We'll also be posting some of the resources we use today. And I wanted to remind you too that in the chat, you'll find the link to the free, Ellie reminded us, free online course for overindulgence. Our next webinar from the Financial Security for All Community of Practice will be June the 28th, same at this uh, same time. Mm -hmm. so and I. And excuse me, I would like to thank both Laura 
and Mark for all their assistance, wonderful assistance, in helping to conduct the webinar today and help us share our story. So thank you. Sure. And then one last question someone asked about CEUs. Are CEUs available for this webinar? Um, we, I don't have any CEUs approved at this time, but I would be happy to look into having that done later. Could you tell me what uh, particular, is there a particular type of CEU that you need? And if you could, yeah, I think if you could fo follow up with that in either chat or Q&A. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, social work, I think, is what they, what they, they put in chat. Alrighty, any any closing thoughts from any of our pan panelists? Uh, Jean, did you see that Mark Ilsley said hi, Mom? Mm, uh, <laughs> we did see that. <laughs> thanks, Mark. All right. If no other thoughts, then uh, again, thanks, uh, thanks for thanks for for everyone. And Laura, if you look in Q and A real quick, I, I think you just saw that. Uh, I got it. Thanks. We'll see. check into that. CEUs for accredited financial counselor. We'll we'll check into it. Thanks. All right, and if there is nothing else, again, thanks everyone, and we will see you next time. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.